Today's video is brought to you by Squarespace, and there's a link in the description below to www.squarespace.com forward slash Kenobi to get 10% off your first purchase. So if you're looking to support the channel and start your website, you can put the link in the description below. More on that in a moment. Okay, 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 it's time for a confession. It's confession time. We're literally, what, 10 seconds into this video, 20 seconds into this video, I need to make a confession. Whilst the Dark Depths combo that we talk about in today's video is essentially the only snow-based combo deck in Magic, if we exclude, I don't know, Scred and a Stuffy Doll or Astrolabe and a basic land in that conversation, I do have to admit, it being snow is completely inconsequential. Prior to the arrival of Arkham's Astrolabe to take a huge diarrhea shit all over non-rotating formats, whilst being defended by anyone who actually plays the fucking thing, but, but guys, it makes Legacy cheaper. Before all of that, before Astrolabe graced us with its presence, there was only really one snow-based permanent that was played at any competitive level. Now, snow-covered mountains were kind of in Scred, but Scred isn't a combo deck. This is the snow combo that just happens to be snow. This is Dark Depths, a frozen tomb of an ancient foe, the icy lake in which Marit Lage herself slumbers. This land can, for the low low investment of just 30 mana, that's 3 mana 10 times over to remove 10 ice counters, it can be cracked open to reveal the not quite an Aldrazi, the primordial horror within, a 2020 indestructible flying creature, Marit Lage. To date, Marit Lage is the largest power and toughness seen on an MTD creature. Importantly, not the largest on a card, as this technically isn't a card. The largest creature card is probably the BFM, a silver border 99.99, but outside of silver border joke sets and non-tournament legal stuff, it's the impervious great worm clocking in at a native 16.16 on the card. Now, when the only thing bigger than you in this metaphorical pond is a literal joke, it might suggest that you are a serious, serious threat. But 30 mana is a lot. But really, the 30 mana investment is kind of flavor text. There are much cheaper and more efficient ways to thaw out this monstrosity. Marit Lage and her Dark Depths have become a legitimate win condition that has been present in one form or another since its best friend was printed in Zendikar block. Hello there. This series, the Low Watt series, looks to help you understand the combo decks, the infamous combo decks of Magic, from turn one kills to unfair decks that feel borderline broken. I want to demystify the things that they get talked about and joked about in Magic circles and in eternal format uh, Reddit posts and things like that, but people might not know what Cheerios or Cephalid Breakfast is. So in today's video, we're going to talk about not just Dark Depths, but Turbo Depths. I hope you like Fat Bottom Girls, because Marit Lage is one of the thickest, baddest bitches in all of magic. But first, a quick message from our sponsor. The internet is a vast, sprawling hellscape of loud opinions and angry nerds, and I am no exception to that. But I rise out of that tumultuous sea of geekdom like a bastion, like a lighthouse of hope, a shining golden beard of sensual, succulent energy. But for some reason, I never got around to making a website. I just kind of fearful that it'd take me a lot of time, and that learning HTML was a thing that I just didn't have the time to do, and all that jazz. But not with Squarespace. This is the super easy to use platform that has no plugins, no updates, and no patches, ever. It just works in your browser, and it's super intuitive, and puts stuff together super easy. The site I have made here is a work in progress, but I want to have some sort of moving image in the landing page behind my introduction, where I show that Phil both my Discord calls me daddy. Three clicks later and boom, it's T. The T video is behind it, it's T. That's the website. So if you're thinking of setting up a website to be a portfolio for your own photography or writing or just to promote your own hobbying, then I can't recommend Squarespace enough because it's just so simple and easy. There is a link in the description below and in the pinned comment to squarespace.com forward slash Kenobi. That's squarespace.com forward slash K-E-N-O-B-I. That's K-E-N-O-B-I. Almost stumbled over my letters there. For you to get 10% off your first purchase with Squarespace. Also, check out my website in the description below. There's a link to pleasantkenobi.com. It's a bit of a vanity project and a meme at the moment, but I want to start using it to show off some of my content, rank better in searches on the internet, and just show the brands, teams, and collaborations that I've worked with. Right, with all of that out of the way, let's talk combo. History. Dark Depths as a card lay dormant, frozen underneath non-synergistic ice and a state of lethargy for several years after its release in Cold Snap. It only became the big lad on campus when it got a new friend. 
Vampire Hex Mage, which first emerged fully formed from the birth canal of Zendikar, an inconspicuous little 2-1 vampire with first strike that is aimed at taking characters off planeswalkers and perhaps other cards in its format like quests in its own block and level up creatures later on in the block. The unforeseen result of this ability to take counters off of any permanent was that it could take counters off of Dark Deaths. And suddenly, you're triggering this ability here. This one that checks for ice counters. Without them, boom goes the dynamite. And suddenly, you got a 2020 motherfucker. This became a consistent thing in bug and blue-black variants in Extended. Extended is the larger rotating format that was like two to three standard stapled together. It predated modern as the big, not quite legacy, but beyond standard format. But that isn't the end of the story in terms of understanding how this combo came about. In 2013, with the rise of Commander and the prevalence of Planeswalkers as a card type as a marketing strategy at the forefront of the fucking game, Wizards looked to rework how the Legend rule worked. It used to be that summoning a legendary permanent onto the battlefield would immediately nuke any other versions of it in play, including itself. For example, if anyone had a Bruno in play and you played a Bruno of your own, summoning into existence when it already was existing would cause some sort of like temporal or existential fissure and they'd both explode, they'd both die. It could be done with a clone as well. So you've got a Bruno and I play a clone copying Bruno, they would both cease to exist upon resolution, upon it entering the battlefield. It was weirdly flavorful and interesting in some ways, and it was good if you liked every clone spell being a destroyed target creature for any commander even the hexproof ones but it wasn't intuitive and whilst having my attempt to summon like a second copy of a legendary character caused them to explode that made sense having a shapeshifter or body double or an illusory copy of it cause it to die didn't make sense so they changed the rule the new ruling allowed for the same legend that was already in play to be in play under another player's control. What it did was when you played a legendary creature as a state-based action, it checked if you had another one of the same name, and if you do, you get to pick one to keep. You sacrifice the rest. This meant that each player could have an Avacyn in play, for example, which is weird and it's counterintuitive and goes against the old flavour of the old rule, but the end goal was to allow each player to play with their toys, and wizards like people to play with their toys, that's why they hate mass land destruction. What this meant was that Dark Depths got a lot better. Not only did you now have Hex Mage as a combo piece, but now you had Thespian Stage, a card from Dragon's Maze, as a way to make a 2020 and slap people to death with it. Thespian Stage now allowed you to copy the Dark Depths and choose to keep the Thespian Stage copy and send the Dark Depths with the counters on it to the bin. Then you would have a Dark Depths with no counters, which triggers this trigger here, and surprise, motherfucker, you have a 2020. A fun little aside here, this trigger on the Thespian Stage copy of Dark Depths, you can stifle. It will resolve the stifle, but then it checks again and re-triggers again. There are many an anecdote of people trying to stifle this trigger, failing miserably, or succeeding, but then it still makes a 2020 anyway. Another weird aside as well is that I've heard people talk about Vesuva doing this combo in Commander. And whilst Vesuva can enter the battlefield and copy a Dark Depth that's already in play, it will just leave you with another Dark Depth with 10 Ice Counters. Even if you select the Vesuva one to keep, the old one dies, Vesuva comes in ET being with the Ice Counters on it. The reason Thespian Stages have the Ice Counters is because it's already in play and doesn't enter with 10 Ice Counters on it. It becomes a copy of Dark Depths without the counters. So that's the combo, but what about the deck? Well, there's a weird thing with Dark Depths, where it actually appears in many decks in Legacy. There is a variant of control called Lands, which utilizes lands and land synergies and land recursion to control the game. And then Marit Lager out of Dark Depths is one of, and normally the prominent, like, uh, end game of that deck. It kind of gives it an inevitability, because you can Dark Depths combo, they can deal with the Marit Lager, and you can life and loam it all back and go again. In addition to that, there's aggro loan variants, and also this, this Dark Depths combo showed up in other decks like Maverick, for example, the Dark Maverick variants. Today's video, though, I want to talk about Turbo Depths, which is the most combo-tastic variant of it. It doesn't want to take the game long, it wants to make a Marit Lager as early as possible and kill your opponent. Turbo Depths relies on both of the old-school pieces, both Thespian Stage and the Vampire Hex Mage, which I want to call Vex Mage, but I don't think that's the right... that might be confusing. In order to go down this combo route, the deck plays explosive start enablers in the form of fast mana. We have four copies of Lotus Petal and four copies of Elvish Spirit Guide to allow this deck to have nut draws of turn two and three kills by making Marit Lages on turns one or two. You will notice a lack of Mox Diamond, namely because mulliganing in this deck is a necessity and Mox Diamond is not a mulligan friendly card, requiring you to commit two cards in hand to accelerate your start. 
Beyond this, the Dark Depths combo can be tuned to be faster or slower, whilst having varying levels of interaction in your deck. Some variants of the Turbo Depth deck may be less turbo by having Decay and Assassin's Trophy main deck, but instead we have it in the sideboard of this particular composition. This list is card for card what Negator77 was playing on MTGO a month or two back uh, when he was stomping towards trophy dominance. There's a great league where Negator, aka Tom Hep, plays with Anurag Das over on channelfarber.com. I'll put a link to that in the description below if you want to see a full league with a master of this deck. Whilst we don't have removal main board, we do have hand disruption to allow us to see what our opponent is up to and dismantle pesky uh, disruption strategies like Trophy and Plowshares. You see, there is interaction that hurts the depths combo quite significantly, but it's not necessarily just your simple source of the Plowshares targeting your Marit Lage, although that's still an issue. Assassin's Trophy, for example, and a Wasteland by extension, allow your opponent to blow up the dark depths or the stage in response to an attempt to go for the combo, which is something you have to play around. Depending on what they're using, there are different parts where they can disrupt. For example, they can allow the um, Dark Depths to go to the bin, the Sesame Stage to be left over, copying Dark Depths, and then with the trigger on the stack to crack it and make it 2020, they just blow it up. And then they've got two for one on their removal spells. With Raceland being this kind of issue and Crackers being an omnipresent uh, solution to the problem we're putting down, it means that Turbo Depths will often main deck Pithing Needle or Pything Needle. I can't remember what the correct pronunciation is, and I've watched that Magic Man Sam video twice. Needle can be used to blind name Wasteland or Caracas ahead of it being a problem later in the game, or other problem permanents. The prominent one that I can think of right now is Khan the Great Creator, as if it ticks down to grab a bridge uh, from below, not a bridge from below, an ensnaring bridge, we cannot beat a bridge game one in our current composition. Needle rewards knowledge um, of the, the metagame in general and reps with the deck, similar to how Revoker does in Death and Taxes. Then we have our final piece of combo protection, which is not of this world. I would call this a staple in the sense that you see it in certain decks and legacy regularly, but it's only really seen in the Turbo Death decks. I think this card will often blow out inexperienced players, as it's not something that people talk about very much. It's a 7 mana Eldrazi instant that's actually free when you use it alongside Marit Lage because of her size. It's a stifle or counter spell for removal, for Caracas activations, for echoing truths, or flicker wisp ETB triggers, and so on and so on. It's incredibly versatile dealing with most problems. Force of Will has proven time and time again that free counter magic is super important, especially for the combo decks, as much as it is for decks looking to beat combo. This is our force of will that allows us to push through one piece of interaction blow out our opponent and hit them with 2020 when they thought they were safe and lastly where would any self-respecting combo deck be without tutors namely in this case we have crop rotation and sylvan scrying Obviously, these help with the consistency of putting together your combo, especially when two potential pieces are lands, so both of them hit both Thespian Stage and Dark Depths, but Crop allows you to, at instant speed, interact in ways that people don't expect. Uh, Bajuka Bog allows you to blow out graveyards, where Ghost Quarter allows you to dismantle a Wasteland or Caracas plan from your opponent prior to going off. And then there's Sajiri Step, which protects against removal spells. If you bring it in and, and give yourself protection from blue or protection from white, you can blow your opponent out when they try and bounce or kill your mouth. Lane. Having a utility at instant speed built into your combo enabling shooters is incredibly strong. So with all that out of the way, what do we not want to see? I've already mentioned Caracas and Wasteland and anything that can blow up your um, lands at instant speed like Assassin's Trophy and Plowshares being a direct problem to killing Marit Lage. Although she's indestructible, she can be exiled. Well, firstly, we're kind of weak to Chalice of the Void, which is a strange thing, like, when you look at the deck thinking, oh, I'm going to make a 2020, who cares about Chalice? Well, we have, like, 17 cards that care about Chalice. And although we can just raw dog, draw Dark Depths combo and make it 2020, this will disrupt a huge amount of our combo, and also meaning that we can't interact with them either, because all our interactions are one mana in Thoughtseize, Inquisition, and Duress. Further to this, our own mana base is pretty garbage. We have 11 colorless lands, if you include Caracas and Sedge Step in there, because they make white mana, and we have no white spells and dark depths well it doesn't make any mana unless you have urborg in play which allows it to tap for black urborg plus dark depths is two black mana and you, which you can make a hex mage with and make a 2020 form so urborg is very good in the deck but playing four of them means that sometimes you just draw two urborgs and they're legendary which means they're only a temporary uptick in mana. You can't progress your board state with them. So yeah, the, the mana base is clunky, it is awkward. You have to mulligan regularly or you'll keep a hand only moments later to realize, shit, I have a black and a green spell. I can't cast both. So in addition to that as well, Blood Moon is a problem. Not only 
Well, Blood Moon out of the sideboard are decks that side into it, not so much, but the dedicated Blood Moon decks, the, the, the prison decks, for example, which aren't as common in Legacy anymore, but a turn one or two Blood Moon not only shuts down your compo, but it's so disruptive to your mana base, it usually means you can't play much magic and you just have to, well, hope to get lucky. And by that, I mean you can't interact with it in turn game one anyway. And that, my friends, is the Big Booty Merit Lady in a Dark Deaths combo. Let's look at some examples of how it plays then. In this clan post match, our opponent knew exactly what I was up to due to my turn one needle on manifold key after they'd popped off a little bit here. A sorcerer's spyglass on dark depths and then a follow up one on the next turn on Thespian stage leaves us with no land based combo. We thought seize and see an eye of Ugin, which allows us to know that they've got Eldrazi coming. We can stop this from being a win here though by being just aggressive with a 2 1 first strike. We deploy a vampire hex mage and just start beating face, which coupled with the ancient tombs they've been using quite aggressively means they could just die before they get to cast anything that wins in the game. We use our crop rotation to find a ghost quarter once they shoot it for the uh, the Eldrazi, the 10 mana one, the Nulamog, and then we ghost quarter the Eye of Ugin, which means they have to draw a 2 mana land, one of their soul lands, off the top if they want to cast their Nulamog. They don't, so on the following turn we hit them down to 6, which means they can use 2 Ancient Tombs but not 3. On the final turn they top deck a soul land, allowing them to cast Nulamog, but it's an Ancient Tomb. So, they respectfully kill themselves with the 6 damage from the lands, and it just goes to show that sometimes the pressure from a 2-1 first striking vampire is enough if your opponent can't put a clock back on you. This match was like a masterclass of some of the things I've talked about. In the second game, I just got screwed by them playing a Chalice of the Void on 1 and me having a hand of 1 drops, and I didn't really consider that when thinking through my mulligans or my sideboarding. Um, so that was on me just being a bit rusty. And now a few more gameplay examples with some live commentary from me talking over the top of them. Enjoy. Turn 1 Inquisition allows us to find that our opponents are on some form of reanimator with a Grizzle Brand in hand, three cantrips, a Lotus Petal, Ancient Tomb, and a Polluted Delta. I did to the Brainstormers as the best of their cantrips, considering they have a Fetch Land in hand uh, and a Petal in their hand as well, which means they can cast a cantrip and then use the Fetch Land to shuffle shit away. They fetch a Volk, play a Preordain, we untap and draw a Crop Rotation, so we can easily go and get both of our combo pieces now. And we have the extra mana in hand, so we actually drew pretty hot here. They drew a Force of Will which was the card we didn't know about. So that's, that's a shame. To say that's a shame is an understatement. That's actually pretty brutal. Uh, they did ditch two cards to do that, but that means we're now an entire draw and or tutor and or turn away from combo. Ancient Tomb and Lotus Petal from our opponent. Sneak attack from our opponent. So they're gonna hit us with a Grizzlebrand next turn off of the sneak attack. Now, we can crop rotate for a Caracas to bounce the Grizzlebrand during combat, so we take nothing and they don't gain the uh, seven. The problem is, they're probably just gonna make a Grizzlebrand here, draw a load of cards, and then put an Emrakul into play, which means we can't go to combat. It means we have to bounce prior to They draw seven. They play a Volk, they make an Emrakul. We're going to crop rotate, but the fact that they have seven cards in hand means they could easily have a Force of Will here. Or another pedal to follow up with once this is all resolved. They don't have a Force, so they draw another seven down to two. So they cast the Days, and we pay for it with the Black Mana we floated. Another Days, so we're going to pay for that as well. Grab a Caracas. Now, like I said, if they have Petal here, we'll end up bouncing the Emrakul, and then they can just play it again this turn, and they can play it again next turn as well. We're taking seven here, and what we're trying to do is just draw a needle to name the sneak attack. Because otherwise we just die to Emrakul next turn. We can't bounce it, because after it attacks, it'll sack all our permanents. We draw a Lotus Petal, which doesn't get us there, so we have to go to game two. Okay, so we have the, a way to deal with sneak attack, but not a way to deal with show and tell. We have part of the combo, and we have a Caracas, though, so I'm going to keep this. We lead with Urborg into Needle in case we draw a Vampire Hex, and it makes next turn we can cast with the Dark Depths. We're going to name Sneak Attack at this point. It turns off one of their potential um, <laughs> game-winning combo pieces. We still have Show and Tell and possibly Omniscience, depending on their composition, to deal with as well. Lotus Petal into Ponder from our opponent. Volcanic Island from our opponent. We drew a Veil of Summer, which is pretty good here. Play a Dark Depths. Play a Lotus Petal. I'm not sure the upsides and downsides of playing out a Petal early here because of a potential Rogue a braid out of their sideboard, but I think they'd be aiming that at the Needle, if anything. So I think the Petal is pretty safe. Here comes the Show and Tell. So we let it 
resolve we put a Caracas in. We're hoping it'll be a legendary creature. A Grizzlebrand will be rough because they get to draw a load of cards. It's an Emrakul. That's good for us. We now get to return that back to their hand. And we get to untap and all is good in the world. We got a land out of it and they lost two life. We find a Verdant. We play the Verdant. And we just pass back to our opponent. We might be cantering our Veil soon to try and find a Tutor. But Veil is very good for protecting, well, the Tutors. And also it gives our creatures protection from blue and black via Hexproof as well. If they have an Echoing Truth or a Wipe Away or similar. Brainstorm from our opponent. Lotus Petal from our opponent. We draw a crop rotation, which puts us where we need to be. We can now go and get a Thespian Stage. We have a Veil of Summer to protect it. And we also have Force of Vigor, if that's a thing we need. Um, it's going to hit Sneak Attack is why I brought it in. I don't know how good it really is, considering we're a Needle deck anyway. They braid on Needle, which suggests they're about to play a Sneak Attack, right? <laughs> Ponder from our opponent. End of turn, we crack our Verdant Catacombs. Grab a forest. Float a green. We're actually to make a green. We're going to crop rotate the Urborg, I think. No, we'll crop rotate the forest, actually. I think that's better. Force of Will pitching a daze. Okay, let's see. They've got another force here for our Veil of Summer. They do not. We draw another crop rotation. We grab a stage. We activate to copy our Dark Depths, and they scoop it up. We got there. So... Veil of Summer coming in incredibly powerful, as we all know already, a beating force of will. Jeez, Cryptic Command for one mana is pretty good. This hand, it's got a lot of good magic cards in it, but not good enough. We're going to mulligan this. This hand has some Dark Depths in it, <laughs> but not much more. A Caracas is reasonable. It's got one of the combo pieces. It's got Force of Vigor. I'm really tempted to keep this, but I don't think it's right to keep this. Tell me in the comment section below, if you're new to the deck or experienced with the deck, would you have kept this ditching one of the Dark Depths? We are on the draws. So we do get to draw a card here. The Krakus interacts well with a random uh, Emrakul or Grizzlebrand to play, but I think they won't do that again, I imagine, considering how we got them last time with it. And Force of Vigor allows us to blow up a Sneak Attack if they play it ahead, like early, although if they play it with a red mana up, they get an activation anyway, and that's bad news for us. We drew a crop rotation, which is good, except for the fact we don't actually have a green source. Uh, we're going to play Ghost Quarter here. And I won't play the Petal, because playing it out to get it abraded, if we might need it, is bad. What we really need to do is some form of hand attack or have a Force of... Um, not Force of Vigor, sorry. Uh, have a... Oh, wow. They just... Wow, 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 wow. They just double Simeon Spirit Guard out of Sneak Attack. Okay... I'm going to blow that up on end step, or at least try to. We got there. That was a three for two. I'll take it. Play a Lotus Petal. We'll cast this Sylvan Scrying we just drew. I kind of want to get an Urborg so we can Dark Depths. But we need a green source for the crop rotation, so we have to get a Bayou. Play the Bayou. Our shields are a little bit down here. Show and telling out a creature, which they obviously have a creature in hand, otherwise they wouldn't have gone for the sneak attack. That could get them again with a Caracas. Or if they show and tell a Grizzle Run, they draw a lot of cards. But they didn't have a land in hand, hence the Simeon -ing 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 out early. So nothing from them. We untap and we draw a needle. We're definitely playing the needle this turn. It's whether we know a blind name Grizzlebrand or Sneak Attack. Now we're more like to die to them going Soul Land, Sneak Attack, Petal. But they haven't got a Soul Land in hand, although they would have played it, and they haven't got a Petal in hand, otherwise they would have activated the Sneak Attack. So I don't think Sneak Attack's the problem. I guess them showing telling the Grizzlebrand in their hand is worse for us. Okay. <laughs> they don't wait to see what we name. But it's enough to get the concession. So as you can see, Needle is quite the powerful magic card as well. Another one. Okay, so we can pedal into the Sylvan Square and to go grab a Dark Depths to Urborg Vampire Hexmage Dark Depths. This seems pretty hot. I'm going to keep this. We might need to preemptively Needle something first, depending on what our opponents get up to. Mox Opal from our opponent. Mishra's Bauble from our opponent. Lotus Petal from our opponent. Are we going to get Wield turn one? Oh, come on. Our hand's pretty good. Don't do that. City of Traders. Emery. Emery puts Urza in the bin, but no wheel. So that's good. Bauble. Sure. Remember, Needle can't stop Mana Ability, so I can't stop Mox Opal, Lotus Petal, Lotus Petal, but I can stop Emery. We drew another Sylvan Scrying. Now, I could... I could play Needle here to name the Emery, but at the moment all it's doing is replaying Baubles, which isn't that hot for them. If I don't use the petal now, they could untap, play a Khan, and then our petal is forever useless and we have access to a green source. So I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to Sylvan Scrine, just in case of Khan, the great creator, disrupting our game. No force of will from them is good. We grab Dark Depths here. Next turn we can go uh, Dark Depths, tap for two black, make a Vampire Hex, thanks to Urborg, Tomb of Yorgmoth. Khan is still a problem though. 
Khan can be played off another Soul Land, ticked down, and make him for three mana play an Ensnaring Bridge, which we can't beat. End of turn, they sack a pedal and two mana to cast a whole breacher. Okay. They're going to replay the petal, which turns on the Mox Opal. They're going to sack their City of Trades after playing a Seat of the Synod. I don't want to see a Narset ticking down to find... No, even a Narset ticking down to find the, the wheel is fine here. We don't want to see anything that makes flyers. We don't want to... Oh, they're going to just hands down wheel. Should have needled them. Okay, they wheel us. We get nothing. They get seven tre treasures. We've lost. We've lost. They had it. They had it. Um, there wasn't really any way to stop the whole Breacher combo there. Our opening hand has no green mana. Like I said in the in the, the bit prior to all these games, is that uh, the mana base in this deck is kind of garbo. Uh, we cut down on one drops a little bit by trimming two crop rotations in case they are a turn one chalice this time. But we can't keep them. This hand, this hand makes a turn two Merit Lage. Just with no protection. So I don't think we want the Velosum. I think we put the Velosum back. We try for the turn two Merit Lage. And we see where we go from there. <laughs> um... What do I blind needle? Khan the Great Creator? Because again, they could turn two, make an ensnaring bridge potentially, and that would be bad for us. Now, if we draw another green source, we might just play the petal out first to play a collector oof and go from there. There's an argument for us doing that in the first place. Because now they fit an echo with the Lion's Eye Diamond, they just get to spin it again, and we're miles off from where we wanted to be. They're not going to. Okay, interesting. Yeah, we drew a Verdant here. I'm using my petal up now while I play this Collector Oof. I've got the Verdant Catacombs to play on one days. And of course, if they have two, we can have a Spirit Ground on the second one. They're going to crack their Bauble now. And crack their other Bauble now. Collector Oof has entered the chat. Ancient Tomb and a Lotus Petal. They activate Emery and they play the Mox Opal. They didn't cast the Echo of Aeons using the Ancient Tomb in the Island, which I would have done. Well, would I have done? Actually, no. It would have gave us a ton of cards in hand. That would have been pretty bad. They shouldn't do that. Okay. We're going to grab Bayou. We're going to untap. We're going to play a Dark Depths. And for all they know, we can't actually do anything here. If we swing with Collector Oof, they might slam a Hole Breacher into play. Which then would have to decay. That will put our shields down. So I'd rather have the option of making a Merit Lady in their end step. And if they make a Hole Breacher now, that's fine. If they wheel next turn, we kill the Breacher. That's what happens here. That said, we might allow them to wheel anyway. I'll just make a Merit Lady in response. Because they'll get a load of treasures they can't use. They'll have all their mana used to cast the Echo. And we've got a 20 to bobble from our opponent. Cast the Echo. Echo on the stack. Bear in mind we'll get to draw nothing because of the Hobbit. So we can kill the Hobbit and draw 7. Or we can just make a 2020 and kill them next turn. I really don't see a world where we struggle with a 2020 in play. They could play a singular blue source and then play a Chain of Vapor. But this deck is a Chalice deck, so it shouldn't be playing one drop interaction. Yeah, we're going to make the Merit Lage here. So what happens is Stage copies the Dark Depths. Then we choose a copy to keep. We're going to keep, right click and keep this one. And then the, the, the effect triggers. It sees no ice counters. It makes a 2020. And now we discard. They get seven cards in hand and a load of treasures. But all the treasures don't work because of Collector Oof. And now I'm just going to hit them with a 2020 in my turn. Headshot. Oh, no, that worked. That worked. So the Collector Oof meant that they couldn't realistically deal with the Merit Lake. They couldn't uh, get a Khan, for example, and go get things out of the sideboard to deal with it, like a Tumble Magnet or an Ensnaring Bridge. Yeah, Collector Oof, MVP. This hand has a Needle, a Force of Vigor, and an Oof, but we're a land short. I'm gonna keep it. <sighs> Am I gonna keep it? I'm gonna keep it. We're on the draw. We need one more land or mana source for an Oof. Oof is good, as we saw. Yeah, I think this is a risky keep, but I think it... I mean, the payoff is huge. We have 21 more lands. We have four petals. We have four simian uh, elvish spirit guides. We got it all. And we drew it. We actually drew it. Let's go by you. Whilst they don't have days up, let's go needle. Let's needle. It's Khan or Narset. And they're not necessarily playing a Narset next turn. Let's name Khan the Great Creator. Because they can go soul land into Khan. And I don't want that. See the Synod, which we'll turn off with our great oof collector. Psymaster Thopterist, our arch nemesis, because it makes 1-1s. One oh dear. How many 1-1s one do they make here? Probably a lot. We can fight through them eventually. And Collector Oof is going to be real good. No wheel to the bin. Double force to the bin. No more 1-1s one today. Okay. We drew a Veil of Summer. Now, if they have a Daze here, they can't cast it because they have no islands. So we're going to turn off the majority of their mana. Now, we could have just slammed Hex Mage and had crop rotation... Um, crop rotation into Dark Depths of Volunteer to make a 2020. But I think turning off like all but two of their mana is very good here. Now, Marilyn's got to swing through this endless stream of 1 1s. So we take one here. 
Would love to see another mana source here. Would love to see a green black mana source with some description. Sylvan Scrying. Well, 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 well. Options are Sylvan Scrying for a third land, playing Vampire Hex Mage, or just abrupt decaying the Psy. We're going to kill the Psy now, so they can't make any more 1 1s. We won't be swinging in because the group block will kill our collector if we can unlock their deck. They attack us for 2 in the air. We draw a Duress. We're going to cast Sylvan Scrying. They're going to force of will this. And that's fine. I'd rather do that than the Vampire Hex Mage, honestly. No attacks. Mainly because I don't want them to then swing back. If we swing for two now, they're the 15, then swing back for three. Their clock gets faster, and our clock doesn't get any quicker because we just want to hit them for 20. Two more 1 1s into the red zone, we get a 14. Do we think they've got a second copy of Force of Will? But I've got Veil of Summer back up of Spirit Guide. We now have Crop Rotation to go and get our Dark Depths. We have Veil of Summer for the Hover Spirit Guide if we want to. Or we have Force of Will just to kill the two 1 1 Thop Thops. So that's pretty good. They attack me, which is strange, because that suggests that they have some other way of blocking or dealing with Merit Lage. Oh, they don't know I've got Merit Lage coming, do they? That's the thing. I'm not going to crop rotate off the Elvish Brook Guide now, because I don't want them to have Force plus a spell. We drew Caracas. Cool. Doesn't do anything here. We need a green or a Axos. We're going to duress them. They have Lion's Eye Diamond, Hold Breacher, and Lotus Petal. They are one mana off breaching us. Fine, I guess. No attacks here. They attack us for two. In the end step, I'm gonna crop rotate a bayou. We're gonna grab a Dark Deaths. We're gonna sacrifice Vampire Hex Mage, targeting the Dark Deaths, and we have won. There you go, Collector Oof, the one of that we were <laughs> looking to. It's not even like I was Sylvan Library, it wasn't even like I was brainstorming. Yeah, Collector Oof is powerful, but you get to see both versions of the combo there. You also got to see in the other clips um, of uh, ways in which we both win and lose through um, things that aren't immediately apparent. A 2-1 body might be good enough, and Legacy and that Charles of the Void is really rough for our Marit Lage deck. So I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you found this helpful and interesting in learning about the Legacy metagame and in particular the Turbo Depths combo. Is there a combo deck that intrigues you that you don't know enough about? Is there a deck name that tantalates your taste buds? Cephalid Breakfast is one that I probably should do in this series. Is there a certain card that you know is good and is comboed with but you don't understand and you like a beautiful handsome bearded boy to explain it to you on the internet? If any of those things ring true then let me know in the comment section below what you would like to see in the future. Don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe if you haven't already, like 40 to 50% of people watching these videos aren't subscribed and if you subscribe one day I'll get a plaque that makes it feel like all this was worth it. In the meantime don't forget if you're looking to set up a website around your hobby or passions you can get 10% off your first purchase at Squarespace with the link down below squarespace.com forward slash pleasant kenobi in the meantime be good to one another i'll speak to you all soon there'll be more videos coming soon ta-ta for now